Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Say with me, thanks be to God. Can you think of a time when you wanted to be chosen for something? Maybe you'd applied to a school or a job or several jobs. Or maybe it was a date with someone you had a crush on. There's something so vulnerable and scary about that desire to be accepted, wanted, chosen before it's been answered with that word we all wait to hear, yes. Uh, And for some reason, if you're like me, when you're waiting for that person or institution to say yes, uh, you can't help but catalog all the reasons why they won't choose you. Uh, my grade in that class could have been better. I didn't answer that interview question as well as I could have. I don't have enough experience. That cute person probably thinks I'm super weird. Uh, For the record, they probably do, but that's no reason for them not to like you. There's so much bound up in our desire to be desired. We've received all kinds of messages about who is worthy and what we have to do to prove we're among their number. For the, po- for the most part, no one ever sat us down and gave us like a list of those things. But we learned them all the same from our friends and our parents and then our bosses, from the movies we watched and the pictures in magazines. There's this kind of person we're supposed to be if we want to be wanted. Our scripture this morning opens up some opportunities to reflect on these unspoken assumptions we have about ourselves and our neighbors. This story from Mark's gospel has something to tell us about who Jesus chooses and what that means for all of us. Today, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he chooses fishermen. And in the background of this scene with the fish and the nets is this question, why them? When Jesus finds them on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, they're just in their boats doing their work. The first disciples are laborers just like Jesus had been. This isn't a superhero movie where the leader goes around finding people with magical gifts or mutant powers to forge them into a super team. Simon isn't catching fish with his mind. These people don't have exceptional abilities. They're just people who don't really really own much, so they have to sell their labor to make a living. They're just regular people. That's who Jesus calls. Not the best, not the elite, not the gifted and talented, not the technocrats, not the experts, not the smartest, the cleverest, the richest, the highborn with the most prestigious names and the best connections. No, Jesus goes to the Galilee and calls fishers, which means Jesus might be calling us too. Have you ever felt like the real work of holiness or justice, of being God's people in the world, really falls on other people, exceptional people? Like, you know who I'm talking about. They have radio programs or podcasts, and thousands of people come to hear them speak at conferences. Like, the real movers and shakers. Also, have you ever noticed, like, how pretty all those people are? Like, it's almost like they're just celebrities saying churchy things. If that's who God's using then my job is just kind of to be a nice Christian person who doesn't rock the boat and get in the way so much. 
The real work is for other people, more accomplished ministers or the wealthy who do the bulk of what needs to be done. This reminds me of the Catholic nun, uh, Dorothy Day, who started to gain some notoriety for living and working with the poor in New York City. Uh, people started to talk about her as a saint. She was the kind of person, she sold all of her possessions and went to live among the poor and helped start the Catholic worker movement in New York City. Um, and so people were talking about her as like maybe being a saint and that process has moved along a little bit more, more recently. Uh, but one day a reporter asked her about what she thought of people calling her a saint, someone who in the Catholic church lived a truly sanctified life. And, and her reply was, don't call me that. Don't call me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed that easily. She was saying, I'm not this special magical person. Like, I don't float above the ground like an angel. I'm here with you and you're here with me. So don't call me a saint and think that gives you some kind of excuse to get out of this kind of life. The call of discipleship is not for the privileged few based on ability or power. It's a call for everyone. When we imagine discipleship to be something accomplished by heroes or exemplary figures, we dismiss the possibility of our own calling before we've ever heard it. We catalog all the reasons why God couldn't really want us. Like, of course, Dorothy Day sold everything she had and went to live with the poor in Hell's Kitchen. Of course, Martin Luther King Jr. marched in the streets and was arrested for the sake of justice and rallied thousands and thousands to the cause of civil rights. Never mind all of the, the people, especially women, who like did all the like actual work to organize all of those events. Of course, your favorite pastor or teacher or writer or organizer did things that showed God's love in remarkable ways. Like, of course, they're saints. They're heroes of the faith, super Christians, but not like not me. I'm just like a regular person. But what Dorothy Day is saying is that those people some of us think of as super Christians are really just regular people, too. Don't call me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed that easily. God's calling y'all, too. This is what we affirm when we talk about the priesthood of all believers together. We don't have to go through the talented or the wealthy or the educated to get to Jesus. God's kingdom isn't the kind of thing that exceptional people bring about by their skill or their pretty faces. God's desire is not only for the people we've been taught are desirable. Jesus calls regular people amidst all the limitations that regulate us because God wants us. God wants you. God wants Abraham. It's Abraham who says, I'm too old. God wants Moses. It's Moses who says, I talk weird. God wants Gideon. It's Gideon who says, but I'm scared of literally everything. And God doesn't want us in spite of those parts of us, but with them. God wants the old and the scared and the quiet and the anxious and the crazy, your aching back and your weary soul and your five-year-old talking to you over your shoulder. Hey, buddy, I'm in the middle of a sermon. Can we talk in a minute? I love that you're wearing your costume. Come to me and I will give you rest. No matter how well you talk, or if you can talk at all, God wants you. Not because you're smart or rich or pretty or measure up to some imagined normal that we've been taught to wield against ourselves. God wants you just because that's who God is. That's the kind of God we find in Jesus who calls to Andrew and Simon and James and John and you and me and them too, whoever they are. Of course, God's desire for us is often hard to hear. It's hard for us to accept that of ourselves, that we are desired just because of who God is, just because of who we are. And that's not an accident. There are forces at work under the surface, behind the scenes, over our shoulders, regulating us, telling us to stay where we are, convincing us that we are not called, but then also teaching us to point to others and saying, if I'm not called, then they're really not called so that we feel a little bit better about ourselves. Before Jesus calls the fishers, the storyteller drops in almost offhand. The detail that this all happened 
happens right after John the Baptist was arrested. That's the context for calling, for discipleship, for the knowledge that you are desired by God. Not this placid, bucolic scene in the countryside where rustic fishermen choose to leave their blessed existence behind for Jesus. They live in a world with a cruel king killing people who go out into the wilderness preaching the kingdom of God. They live in a world where people are taught to stay in place and stepping out of place can get you killed. They're disciplined to hold on to their nets and catch more fish because that's who you really are. That's all you're really good for. Hold on to your nets. I wonder if sometimes it didn't feel like their nets were holding on to them. Like they were the ones who were caught. These forces that shape the world, these voices whispering stories in our ears about who we are, that we're not desired for anything more than what we produce. They become so familiar, so constant that they become a part of us. We can't tell the difference between those voices and our own. And so to know that we are called, desired by God, desirable in ourselves as bearers of God's image, we might have to let parts of us die. Sometimes when Christians talk like that, it's another voice of negation. Like, you're basically bad, so you better let God end it and try again. And maybe in heaven you'll be all right. But I think there are other directions we could walk with the scriptures about dying to self. Like, maybe you are essentially loved and God breathed, but you've been handed some luggage filled with things you think you need, but you really don't. And they're killing you. And you don't see that you are still you without them like a hoarder who can't bring themselves to get rid of some of the things, even though they've barely got any room to sit. And so to find life, you've got to put that stuff down. Maybe to remember that we are desired, called like Andrew and Simon, James and John, we have to drop our nets. The things that are holding us in place, we have to stop mending them, stop peeling the scabs off our pet wounds and learn to live with the scars. If you are convinced that your desirability is found in your work, then that means you will have a very hard time if you can't find a job. Or you might keep powering through when it's killing you. Or you might be resistant to calls to organize in your workplace because you feel like, because you feel that it puts you in a vulnerable position. If you are convinced that your desirability is bound up in your family looking a certain way, then you will torture yourself if it doesn't look the way you want to do. If your desirability is bound up in your health, in feeling good, then when you someday inevitably get sick or lose some of your ability, what then? To know that you are desired apart from those things, you will have to put down those nets of normativity. You will have to let go of those stories about yourself, some of which we hold very, very dear. Putting down your nets, losing your life to find them, that is the cost of discipleship. But it is also the gift of following Jesus. So often those nets that we think we need are just holding us in place when God wants to take us somewhere new somewhere far more abundant, somewhere where we find rest and nourishment. So my friends, may you know that you are called, that you are beloved no matter what, that you are desired by God. And may you have the courage to put down your nets, to step away from any story or practice you've received, any toxic relationship perpetuating those stories, any routine, any job, anything at all that tells you you are not desired by God. May we decide to follow Jesus, who calls to us and invites us to share with each other and our neighbors the good news of God's desire and the disintegration of every net. Amen.